And what are you going to talk about today's visit? A uh, mixture of everything. So I'll go into some growth hacking techniques. I'll delve into uh, kind of initially some of the Google updates that are messing everybody's organic reach up. And then I'll go into some of the stuff in terms of quick wins for Lunar Way. And hopefully leave time for questions. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Uh -huh. Okay, great. So I'm just going to dive in. Um, is Anna kind of already got things rolling? I'm um, the CMO of Valuer. Valuer has been around for almost two years now. Uh, I've been there for a year and seven months. And yeah, we basically won best new startup in Denmark last year. And it's mostly because of growth hacking and just kind of an all out war on organic and trying to do a lot of really crazy things with bootstrap budgets, basically no money. Uh, you might notice by my accent, I'm not Danish, uh, originally from Washington, D.C. I've been in Denmark for the last three and a half years. Uh, I've been all over the place, so came in as the head of SEO and optimization for a company called Plan Day. They're located not too far down the road. Uh, worked as the head of marketing for Genie Belts, basically built them up from zero to 40,000 unique visitors, 600 leads a month. Uh, went over and worked with a bunch of douchebags over at a place called Actimo. Shout out to those guys. Uh, and yeah, basically now I'm over at a great company called Valuer. And Valuer matches startups, corporations. Uh, it's definitely more of a B2B type of push. I'm going to go over a lot of stuff today. Uh, it's definitely under the stipulation of, of reach. And hopefully there's a lot of parallels within that. Uh, as Anna said, I, I am uh, basically teaching the growth hacking course here at Talent Garden. Uh, but I do a lot of guest lectures over at uh, Google, ITU, DTU, CBS, KU, and so on. Um, yeah, I consider myself kind of a startup junkie, uh, mentor, growth hacker, all those fun things. I mean, it's it's all kind of part of the fun. Uh, I think Anna's probably covered enough about Talent Garden, so I'm just going to skip ahead. A uh, little fun fact about me, I was on an American reality show about me moving to Denmark. Uh, so if you Google House Hunters International and Denmark, uh, they've cut it up to make me look like a total douche. So feel free to check that out. Uh, yeah, it's watchable. Um, so my goal for today is provide value. Uh, I'm trying to give you guys the most actionable items that you can take away. Uh, I will give you this presentation. I might pull out a couple of things that are kind of personal links for value or stuff that I, I jump around a lot. You'll see as I go. Um, but yeah, it's one of those things. Feel free to jump in, ask questions. I'm, I'm here at your disposal. So uh, yeah, let's get into it. So I kind of wanted to get a general feel for how technical I should go or, or how advanced this is going to get. And that'll kind of help me placate to you guys. So just by a show of hands, I realize there's two hands on sandwiches, but uh, how many of you are in content or marketing in general? Okay, who's not inside of marketing here? Oh, everybody's in marketing. Oh, okay, cool. Automation? Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. All right, I think that's relatively fair. I mean, I've done these where the entire room is basically no marketers, and so that makes it uh, a little more challenging. You have to kind of ramp people up, um, but that's good. So um, there's been some really crazy changes just within the last three months of the Google algorithms that I wanted to share with people. I'm, I've been doing a few podcasts a week about this stuff because I think a lot of people are trying to figure out what they're supposed to do next with all these changes. So EAT is one of the big ones that's been around for the last couple of years. That stands for expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. The big rollout uh, this year came in May. The June core update is what everybody lost their shit uh, and went nuts about because it, it basically shuffled the deck uh, and really messed up some things within niches, uh, medic especially, but also within tech, finance as well. Uh, and you guys probably will have seen that on your analytics. Um, and it also happened at the same time as the diversity update. Diversity update, uh, I'll go into. Uh, and then the last little bit is kind of tremors. So with these major updates, usually it's February and September when Google rolls these things out. They've done all of them within the last like two and a half months. So it's crazy. 
Um, so yeah, as somebody that really loves SEO and loves to get into kind of the technical side of marketing, a lot of crazy things are happening. So hopefully, or, or maybe you haven't seen that, but I, I want to shed some light on that stuff so you guys get a better feel for kind of what's happening. So EATS, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. The early announcements came in February, but this stuff has been around and talked about for quite some time. The idea is basically you have a set of human quality raters that are employed through Google to go through individual domains and often individual sites within those domains and determine whether or not this is a, a trustworthy site, a site that people would be willing to put their money into. And what that score essentially uh, looks like is very similar to what you would get out of a relevancy score if, if you've ever done anything in terms of AdWords or now it's called Google Ads. But the idea is that you're getting kind of determined before you even get set up to be viewed by Google uh, whether or not your site is trustworthy. The YMYL is this super douchey way of basically Google kind of saying, your money, your life. And the whole concept is basically they don't want to deliver fake stuff to people. So you have a lot of fake news sites like the Daily Mail that got absolutely screwed because they're a tabloid. You also have other sites like uh, CCN. They were basically a cryptocurrency uh, news site that took money from people to basically announce a new cryptocurrency. You got to get involved right away. Uh, medical sites have also seen major downgrades because it's like, eat this and you'll be cancer free in a week. Like these crazy things that are coming out. Google's trying to help people in the sense of basically saying, hey, these crazy people that are doing uh, anti-vaxxer movements, are you guys familiar with anti-vaccine? Uh, maybe we shouldn't put them in page one of what we should think about vaccines, that kind of stuff. In reality, it's good, but I think in terms of the way that you get a lot of false positives on our own pages when we're putting out a lot of content, uh, it, it might not reflect in, in a positive way for what you guys have been seeing. So I think it's important to note that that's what's happening. You also see some really crazy things in terms of your about page. If you look on your analytics, the about page in terms of traffic has skyrocketed. The idea is they're trying to give people a chance to see what is the original source? What is the nature of this website or this group of people that is in this business? And do they seem like they're expert level are they full of shit? Or is there nothing to be said about these people? Therefore, maybe this isn't a great place for you to gather information from. So if you look on your sites now, the about page has probably been a, a significant driver of traffic, which hasn't really been the case before. So it's a really recent change, and we're definitely seeing that over at Valuer as well. Um, and this also goes into, in terms of like the, the content itself, they're really doubling down on uh, grammatical errors and that type of thing. Just within the last year, there's a lot of AI tools that are allowing you to automatically generate content, which is phenomenal if you're a content marker, but it, uh, marketer, but it sucks if you're trying to consume content and you realize this is basically just created by a bot, a spinner. Uh, so all of that stuff is happening and that means you have to get much better with talking about yourself, but also writing the content. The really crazy one that happened uh, was the June core update. This is Another one of those medic updates where, as I mentioned, the anti-vaxxers got hit hard, but screw those guys to begin with. Uh, but this also hit really hard. There's uh, Maricola, super interesting site. They lost 99% of their traffic. And I'm gonna jump around a bit, but I wanted to show the article that the guy put out because he was furious. Obviously, I mean, these are people's livelihoods. This is what people make their money off of. And if you go from 2.1 million unique visitors like Maricola did down to zero practically overnight, I don't know how you're going to pay rent, you know? So these guys went on a, a huge tear about telling people, don't use Google anymore. Use, uh, <laughs> use any other search engine. Try out Bing. And it's like, yeah, no, I'm good. Um, really fascinating stuff. And all of that's happened within the last month. So it, it's pretty wild. Uh, jumped around. Uh, there are additional changes coming to this uh, YMYL thing. Within fintech especially, they're trying to get rid of people that are pushing cryptocurrencies and a lot of, I would say, more kind of almost sponsored type content that is really just hard selling. Uh, something to be aware of, but it's neither here nor there. Just know that a lot of people saw some drastic changes. 
There was a, a change in terms of the mobile experience, uh, and I'll go into what that looks like in terms of basically serving up a shitload of ads and really no organic content, which means as marketers, we have to get very clever with the way that we push our stuff out. And I think there's so much to go into on that. I could probably spend an hour going into deep detail, but I wanna move. I wanna move through this because I think I have like 50 slides for an hour, so. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, so the diversity update was released at the same time. So I put that little image down there so you can see core update happens and diversity uh, rolls out at the same time. Um, what that means is basically the same company can't rank for the same keyword twice, which totally fucks it up if you're trying to go after either brand related keywords or your entire marketing push is related around maybe two or three fr uh, phrases. So what you ended up seeing was a lot of people seeing major drops, and that certainly happened with Valuer. We lost about 18% organic reach because we're ranking for multiple keywords. The winners of this update were people that were selling fraudulent or hacked software. So if people Google Adobe Premiere, then the third and fourth result are people that are like, hey, get Adobe Premiere, the hacked version, cheap, free. And so it's like, well, that wasn't an intended consequence, but there you go. Uh, so I, I find it really incredible that that's happening. I think it kind of makes sense because why would you want to see the same website across the first 10, 20 results? I get it, uh, but super frustrating, which means a diversity of keywords is kind of the solution. Uh, and I'll go into some of that stuff in a little bit. Does any of this kind of resonate with people? Have you guys been seeing some of this, those that are on the technical side, maybe looking at analytics-ish? Cool. Uh, the last little update uh, that I'll touch upon was within July. So it's basically like when there's a big earthquake, you get little tremors afterwards. So they're continuing to shuffle the deck and figure out what makes the most sense, especially per niche. So those that were getting hurt uh, in a really bad way on this core update got hurt again uh, basically a week ago. Uh, that was also Valior. Uh, so it's... It's uh, from bad to worse, and I'm not saying it's all doom and gloom. I'm going to show you a couple of different things to work around this, um, but there's a lot of interesting things that are happening within search just within the immediate, uh, and I, I think there's, there's so much to go into here, but I, I wanted to show kind of how that looks and, and what it's all about. Uh, so I'm doing a few talks uh, within September on kind of the future being paid, and one of the reasons for that is voice. So the concept is, you know, I hear a lot of marketers talk about Google is not a, uh, a search engine, it's an answer engine. So the idea is you're looking for a singular response, a singular answer, not a wave of different answers to choose from. And nothing is more apparent than when you start using Google Home or uh, Amazon Alexa. Does anybody have smart devices at home like that? Okay, awesome. Uh, Alexa, play Despacito. So I certainly do, and I'm aware that the search isn't perfect there, but I wanted to show a quick little video that I had done when I came in this morning, and it really gets to the point of how good you have to be at organic in order to rank, because you're either number one or you're nothing, and that's incredibly frustrating. Um, so let me pull this up. Cool. So I don't think there's audio attached to this, uh, but I searched for uh, a key phrase that I want to rank for within Valuer. So that's uh, digital transformation. That's when large companies want to change processes internally and innovate. Another bullshit bingo buzzword. So the first four things that you see, you can see this little logo up here. It's an ad. That's the only way that you really know it's an ad, but it's the first four things. Before, you would have one ad, now it's four on mobile, which is pretty absurd. Then it goes into image search, and it does give a singular organic search off of, uh, off of that, which is basically the little snippet definition. Oh, boo, sorry. Yeah, I need to jump out of this. Good call. All right, you guys can see my screen now. Okay. All right, let me back up. So four on mobile, and that sucks. Then Google image search, then the answer snippet. And then beyond that, we keep scrolling. Dun, 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 dun. Shocker, it's YouTube videos. Who owns YouTube? Google, right? So there's that. 
Then they encourage you to basically go in and do additional searches on Google, which would essentially put you back into more ads. Then after that, they give you Google's news feed, so top stories via Google. And then at the very end of this, you start getting to the organic results. So that means you have to work either really hard to be number one or not at all. Super frustrating. It's not the same on desktop, but just be aware that mobile is going to be a paid game for a very long time. And considering you guys operate heavily on mobile, you're going to have to pay for this. Uh, it sucks, and that's what we've also seen on social media for those that have been running anything in the way of uh, organic uh, campaigns on social media. The reach that you used to get a year and a half ago, a year ago, significantly lessened within the last year, year and a half. Now you have to either pay to reach similar audiences, pay to reach the same audience, or potentially do something in the way of custom targeting in order to reach that engagement. It's the same on organic and it's coming, and that's happening now, which is super frustrating. So that's kind of the name of the game in terms of uh, what's happening within these. Let me pull my screen back up to full screen. Do you know those changes in the algorithm always no, so that's a fair question. So uh, in terms of the way that you would engage on Android within uh, the US, uh, the Google Trends is this new thing that's basically, um, it's not called Google Trends, it's called like Google Feed or something to that effect. That's coming up just below the search engine. So uh, when you go to google.com or you go to open up a new tab, you already have that just below your search bar. Um, that hasn't been rolled out outside of the United States. And of course, additional languages are going to have a latency period as they catch up to a lot of these. I mean, there's only so many developers that are developing uh, within Norway, Sweden, Denmark, of course, and other languages. So there's always going to be a delay, but what you see in kind of the English side is going to eventually take place across the rest of them. Cool. So uh, I kind of left on a cliffhanger there, but I skipped it. Uh, so what do we do about this? Uh, growth hacking. So there's a ton of different ways to define growth hacking. Uh, the mm -hmm. traditional kind of Wikipedia definition is basically that. My definition is it's doing the most with the least amount of time uh, and money, obviously, to get the biggest results. And I wanna show a few different ways that you guys can use some growth hacking principles, whether it's on content, ideation, or social media, CRO, all that stuff's coming in here. I'm gonna try to blast through this because again, I have a lot of slides, but the goal is to kind of get you thinking in that mindset. So, cool. So to me, growth hacking is doing the work. Uh, the reason that you don't find a lot of growth hacking degrees in universities is because it, it's not theoretical. Growth hacking is actually trying things out, failing, understanding what worked, and then using those learnings to apply to future projects. It's a constant state of ideation. So when I meet with people that have two master's degree, one in business and one in, in marketing, and we start to go back and forth about our experiences within marketing, I think the issue is that there is no practical understanding. So the metaphor I always use is, let's say your car uh, dies, right? Uh, the engine stops working, and you take your car to a mechanic, and he's like, oh, I got two guys that can work on it. One has uh, basically grease underneath his fingernails, and he's like, look, I I've fixed everything within every car available over the last five years, every part I've touched. The other guy says, I've read books on fixing every car and every part available, but I've never actually gotten under the hood. I'd rather have the first guy work on my car. And the reality is you have to be able to do that yourself. And that's where the biggest learning lessons are, is applying you know, this idea of systems. So I always say that marketing is, is a concept of interlinked systems. Basically, if you learn one system really well, you can apply it to the others. So if you're really good with content, you can apply that to SEO. If you understand SEO, you can move into SEM paid. If you understand some of those, you can move into automation and so on. The idea is getting good within different areas to propel yourself forward within uh, all the areas combined. And it's, it's kind of being the Swiss Army knife as opposed to the specific tool. And I think that's a general kind of uh, growth in the direction of marketers because we have to be more technical. 10 years ago, you didn't have to be. It was all about branding and strategy. Um, I, no offense to those that are big branding and strategy people, but yeah, I mean, honestly, there's a long way to go in order to, to understand the why behind the why. I graduated from university with a degree in psychology. 
um, not uh, digital marketing. And I'm able to apply those principles in growth hacking to get better results. But there is no difference between myself and somebody that maybe has done 10 years of this kind of stuff because the idea is you get better with each iteration. Long way to go to get there. Um, so I don't really want to go into deep detail on prioritization, but I do want to touch on some of the stuff that happens within organic and content in general. So the idea of the Pareto principle is the 80-20 rule. So basically 80% of your traffic will come from 20% of your content. And I'll pull up you guys on HRF so you can see uh, it's definitely happening with your calculator on your site in terms of drawing the most traffic. Uh, it, it's definitely that. So, and that's always the case. This is applied to everything, right? So, uh, you know, it's 80% of the people use 20% of your features. Uh, I don't know, 80% of the alcohol is drank by 20% of the population, that kind of thing. Um, so some of the things that I think are really important is understanding what are the key metrics that you should be focusing on. I think you guys probably are pretty familiar with vanity metrics. Uh, it's something that I continue to have to push to my founders on a regular basis because I don't really give two shits about what happens on LinkedIn these days because it is less than 5% of my traffic and less than 0.1% of my total conversions. So the idea is, why should I give a shit? Of course, it's good to be out there and be relevant and try to get people uh, seeing us as a branding kind of push. But in terms of actually doing stuff that matters, I'm looking for sales. I'm looking for conversions that equal money. And that's something that you guys should be thinking about as well. Vanity metrics, it's part of all of us, you know, because every time I post something, I'm looking at the number of views. But a view measured on LinkedIn is when somebody pauses for a split second which to me isn't really a measure of anything. They might've just stopped and be like, what mom? You know, that kind of thing. So um, I'm not gonna go into deep detail on that, but I wanted to go into some stuff in content be because I don't think it's always framed correctly and uh, everybody has kind of different philosophies on this. Uh, there's, there's a great quote uh, from Ron Swanson. I think it's from Parks and Recreation. Never half-ass two things, whole-ass one thing. So the concept is do something really, really well and the results will come. And so I, I wanna show some examples of that, um, but under the framework of the marketing funnel, we've all seen this stuff. You guys should be focused on this, this big part right here. A lot of the stuff that's going to drive a business to consumer type of business like yours is going to be the top of funnel stuff. It's driving interest, it's getting people motivated, it's creating awareness about your, your brand, and the idea is that it's not very difficult to convert a business to consumer type thing because it's either you want it or you don't. There is no three, four, five, ten different meetings like a business to business product like we have. So the idea is that you should be putting out content about everything. I'm going to show a few different examples of why great content works. Uh, has everybody heard, who hasn't heard of Dollar Shave Club? Dollar Shave Club? That's probably a no then, right? You haven't? Okay, cool. Um, well, I'll, I can show the video real quick. Um, so this is Dollar Shave Club. Dollar Shave Club basically was a completely unknown entity. And, yep. And they basically had this video go viral, and that's how everything worked out. Oh, no. Wait. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Yes. Well, for a dollar a month, we send high-quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades, an aloe vera lubricating strip, and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler can use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and ten blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up! Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are going to ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandro, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're going to stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are DollarShaveClub.com, and the party is on. So 
So that video was uh, an instant viral success. 26 million unique uh, views within the span of two and a half years. They were bought out by Gillette for $1 billion. Um, I don't have a billion sitting in the bank. That is a billion dollar video. That's fucking crazy when you think about it. And that's how they got noticed. Everything else just kind of worked out in the long run. Um, a few different quick examples of maybe a business to business type solution. So this is a company called When I Work. I discovered a viral post that these guys put out when I was working over at Plan Day. Uh, the idea is their shift planning software, not the sexiest thing in the world. Uh, but the idea is if you look down here, 3.6 uh, million unique visitors, unique views of this particular piece of content. No matter how hard I work over at Valuer, I'm not going to reach 500,000 unique visitors by the end of this year. It's not going to happen much less than two years. So the idea is one really lengthy piece of content ended up aggregating so many different keywords that they ranked for basically everything within their niche. And that's some of the stuff that you should aspire to. One amazing piece of content will do significantly better than 25 meh pieces of content. And we've all put out meh pieces of content. One of them went live on my uh, company's website last week. So uh, it happens to the best of us. Uh, a local example of this would have been uh, Novo Resume, has anybody heard of Novo Resume? Yeah? Uh, so they put out uh, Elon Musk's resume. And the idea is, of course, Elon Musk doesn't need a fucking resume. The guy's not looking for a job. Uh, but they put out what it would look like. And this ended up getting them advertising. Not advertising. It was basically linked on Times, which then got them on Business Insider, which then ended up pushing them on Forbes. The idea was this thing went viral for... Basically, it's software that allows you to create a resume, but it worked out like crazy for them. And they're still riding the coattails of this amazing piece of content that ended up boosting them beyond belief. So it's one piece of content that will often carry you. Over at Valuer, uh, our version of this is 50 examples of companies that failed to innovate. So it's basically 30% of all of our traffic over the last year has come from uh, this single blog post, which is basically examples of large companies that didn't do something innovative and either went out of business or uh, a disastrous uh, decision, something to that effect. So it is more traffic than our homepage. It's more traffic than the next five blog posts combined. It is considerably the best piece of content that we've put out. Tons of referring domains. It works. So you never know where it's going to come from, and sometimes it comes late, but the idea is one piece of content can potentially drive everything. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. I don't think I know and I need to go into any more detail on that. So um, I wanted to go into a couple of quick things that I think would be really valuable. Uh, have you guys ever heard of the skyscraper technique? Uh, Brian Dean from Backlinko. Nope. Okay, cool. So I'll show you a real quick example, and I'll pick a company within your niche. So uh, this is Ahrefs. It's up there. Uh, who here uses Ahrefs or is familiar with it? OK. You should. Uh, <laughs> you should definitely get on that shit. Um, so a competitor to you guys, uh, Ernest, a uh, bunch of guys out in Silicon Valley, um, offered me almost a job and then rescinded it. So fuck those guys. Um, but I wanted to go into uh, Hrefs for a couple of things. The idea is the uh, skyscraper technique is the concept of the old days of New York. So uh, during uh, kind of the 30s and 40s, it was a great honor to have the highest skyscraper, the tallest building in all of, all of New York. And so the concept was due to the constraints of engineering, you could only get to a certain number of, uh, of floors. So what ended up happening was people started putting giant flagpoles on top of their building saying, now we have the tallest skyscraper in all of New York. And this happened for a good 15 years. So the idea is taking your competitor's best content and making a better version of it. In turn, it's like taking the best player on the competing team out of the game. You outrank them for all the keywords that they end up drawing the users that should be visiting your site or their site into your site. So let me show an example. The way that you would do this is go into top content Dun, 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 dun. Sorry, top pages and then top content. 
So uh, when a URL structure, and that's my side project. So I also, <laughs> I also have another startup that I'm working on. Uh, it's called Architecture Quote, but don't tell people over at Valuer. Uh, <laughs> Ernest.com. Cool. So uh, this is Ernest. They basically do, uh, they do finance for millennials. It's more so related to like home loans and that type of thing, but it's still in the financial niche. It's somewhat related to you guys. So the idea is if you find a piece of content that has been validated, the idea is this stands for referring domain. So a ton of people are linking to it. It gets a lot of shares within different social media channels. LinkedIn isn't in here because they got rid of their open API, which sucks. Uh, but the overall thing is this SP score. Uh, that stands for social power. For me, I, I think there's, there's a big difference between something that has vanity metrics versus something that is kind of cobbled together across different uh, social media channels to be the best piece of content. So the idea is saying, okay, this might be an interesting piece of content for you guys, especially considering the Nordics. So the concept is I want to make a much longer version with more examples and go through in deep detail, make it more skimmable and cite a lot of different things within this article. So they're talking about some statistic, uh, statistics and facts. I would probably go into something in the effect of top five pieces of furniture that people generally buy within first visits of Ikea. You could probably end up getting a lot more creative than just off the top of my head, but the idea is that's one. Easy tips to get a scholarship for college. I don't know, give me uh, one of your competitors. Maybe I can do that. You guys have a competitor? Who is it? Revolut. Revolut. Uh, dot com? Is there an E at the end or just? No? Okay. Cool. So their top content, we got a banking. Mm, Sucker record straight. Auto exchange. It's a lot about features. Top answers for. Eh. I don't see anything that's like super earth shattering here, but they do have a high. Okay, but the concept is your content should be valuable for other people, and you shouldn't necessarily release everything to the world about rah rah go us. We had an ice cream social on Saturday and everybody came into work and look, we have ice cream. Like nobody gives a shit, it doesn't matter. But if something's more valuable to me, then we can talk about it. If there's something that I can then use or I should be bookmarking to check back into. These are a lot of feature announcements. Let me show you maybe value to give a better point on that. So the idea is I'm not making my content about me because it isn't about my company or me. It's about what can I inform people? How can I educate people? How can I make people either feel delight, satisfaction, or something that they can take home and use immediately? So I created, <laughs> this is a great article, the 50 best startup cities in 2019. I put an intern on that, zero research. We just kind of, we, we went for it. We were like, okay, name your 50 best favorite cities because the word best doesn't mean anything. Created a list and within a day we had the prime minister of Helsinki retweeting this article saying, hey, we made number two. And it's like, you sure did. You know, <laughs> it's all made up, you know, and, and that's the great thing about using the phrase the best because it doesn't mean anything. Um, and these are a lot of, as we call them, listicles. So they're articles that are long lists and often in, inserted within them are examples. Uh, there is the skyscraper skyscraper technique 2.0 by brian dean and that is linked within the slides as well uh, that's the original it should be in there somewhere um, but the concept is basically starting to consider the intent of the user as well as a table of contents perfect seo and the h1s and url structure it's also citing lots of examples it's skimmability and of course length uh, and I'm going to go into some of that stuff in a little bit, but you can see a big difference between probably most blog articles and this one. One of the key things that you'll see in here is a ton of visuals. Everybody's hyper visual these days. And the idea of long paragraphs, nobody's reading that. I promise nobody's reading it. Yes. You betcha. Well, yeah, I know that I was going to sit down with you guys. So he's like, fuck it, we'll put Lunar Way in there. So, I mean, it was either you guys or uh, 
one of those guys starts with a C. Um, I don't know. But yeah, I gave it to you guys because I knew I'd be in here. So I don't know. Maybe you are the best. I don't know. Oh, good. Okay. No, it's funny. Um, we referenced some Italian company. Uh, this is kind of a side tangent, but I wanted to, sh wanted to show on. Bear with me. Well, I'm not going to be able to. Eh, hold on. I want to pull it up because it's kind of funny. I mean, the idea is that it, it doesn't. It doesn't really matter, right? The, the concept is, if I were to link to a company that would never give me love for it, then what's the point in putting it out there? Because it's accurate? I don't know. I mean, what's accurate to you? Again, when we say the word best, maybe you guys have the friendliest people, and that's the highest way that I rank the best. You know, it, it doesn't matter to me. But one of the things that I did find yesterday, this guy just added me. Give me a second. He's from uh, Milan, and we had referenced his company as one of the better companies uh, for fintech. So he's used our infographic in his personal LinkedIn profile, uh, which was nice. Um, and then if you go to the company page itself, he's also used our infographic in his company's uh, page kind of banner up there. So great, you know, like get out on the rooftops and, and tell everybody that you're the best and make sure to show a lot of links that that came from Valuer. Thanks a lot. I'll take those back links. That's the way that you have to be thinking about this. What is the most opportune situation? Is it being incredibly honest with uh, the world and yourself and everybody else around you? Or is the goal to drive more traffic, get more engagement and get more uh, backlinks, get more uh, conversions overall? And that's the way that we have to look at it. All right, little tangent, but let's jump back in. Uh, I go into some of the details of Brian Dean's Skyscraper Technique 2.0. Uh, they're linked in here. I'll send you guys this stuff. Table of contents, super important. The idea of showing structure behind it. Examples is becoming the next big thing. I don't know why, but the idea of saying, for example, in the words, actually ends up getting a lot more engagement. So the idea is provide examples within all of these posts. Internal links and external links for relevant content, super important. And obviously skimmability, as I showed you, it almost looks like when I was on desktop that I was skimming on a phone. Cool. Um, this is something that I have always argued with people that come out of uh, journalism uh, backgrounds. And they're like, look, the average article should be 800 words. And I'm like, no, you're absolutely fucking wrong. Let me show you. And the reality is if you look at the articles that are actually ranking for you guys, it's generally the longer stuff. And you don't think off the top of your head, why would, nobody's reading 2,000 words. Yes, they are. They absolutely are. Are you laughing because you've had this conversation? Yeah. Many times. Totally get it. The amount of pictures, the length of the article, yeah, everything. Yeah, I, I mean, of course, in, in a news site and maybe certain publishers, there might be a draw to have a shorter version. Take, for example, The Atlantic. Uh, has anybody heard of the publisher The Atlantic? Very similar to the New Yorker, kind of very fancy. Uh, so they put out three different versions of every article. So they have a small, medium, and large, which is really interesting. So the concept is, if you enjoyed this or you want more detail, check out the long form version of this. And the idea is each canonically links to the next one so that you're not cannibalizing the keywords. It's a really creative and clever way of giving people a chance to digest the small stuff if they're on the go, don't want to sit down and read something long, but if they're really into a topic, give them the chance to consume everything around it. But write that shit, you know? It, it totally makes sense from the standpoint of, of user engagement. So the graphs that I've provided on here, I think I've ripped these from a couple of different sites, but Neil Patel is a really great guide on basically 70% of searches being all about long, really in-depth guides and long explanations of what is, what a topic is all about, that kind of thing. It's just better overall for engagement. So uh, some of the quick wins that I think you guys could get out of this, I'm gonna go into how to structure kind of a keyword strategy, but I think this is kind of a fun thing if you're having difficulty with ideation. Uh, it's uh, basically blog post generators, and these are fun, they're interesting, they develop all kinds of crazy things. So when I was doing one of these sessions, uh, I was asking, it was over at Google, I was asking, will somebody give me like, a business product that they're selling right now. And somebody goes, oh, I sell t-shirts. And I'm like, all right, fuck it. Let's put in 
t-shirts into this title generator. And the titles that came out were uh, five things nobody told you about t-shirts. I want to read that article, right? I'm like, what is nobody telling me about t-shirts, you know? It's one of those things. So let's take, for example, your site. And one of I include a bunch of links in here, but SEO Presser tends to kind of be my favorite. So I'll throw that in there. And let's say personal finance is like a keyword. Personal finance. And it's nice because it allows you to kind of pick either a skill or a generic term. Let's say it's a generic term just to get a little weird with it. And five things most likely didn't know about personal finance. Meh. No, I hate those. Okay. Insurance. Generate. Normally it gives you more than two. Ten things about. Oh, okay. Here we go. So insurance. They're trying to get people to pay for the service, so they're not giving five anymore like they used to. Uh, top five reasons why you face obstacles in learning insurance. I don't know about that. I don't know. We could do a skill and see if it does something different. I don't know. Again, there's tons of these. Seven insurance ideas that can impress your friends. Maybe, maybe. Um, this is why this year will be the year of insurance. I love that. I think that's pretty cool. Um, so, so it really just depends on the direction you want to take, but there is no wrong way to do this. And the idea is take all the different words that are kind of related around the word that you're going after. So. Um, one tool, and I provide, again, a bunch of different tools uh, in a later kind of keyword strategy thing, but I'll, I'll pull it up because we're kind of on it now. But Answer the Public is also kind of one of these ideation tools that I like a lot. Uh, it's this super frustrated old guy that uh, is like, come on, put something in. I know, I know. Um, so I'm going to put insurance in and get questions. And the idea is it basically gives me loosely connected concepts as well as an alphabetical keyword uh, kind of outlook on what I could write about around the phrases within insurance. So the who, what, where, when, why, when, uh, can, <laughs> like there's so much in here. Um, in terms of, what was this section? This was more the prepositional phrases. I don't know. It, it's really interesting when you start going into this. I think it is helpful from either if you're doing something in the way of AdWord campaigns, to start building specific matches or broad match uh, modifiers within this kind of section, knowing exactly what people are searching for, again, based on intent. Um, but this is really helpful to kind of drill down. And also for negative keywords, is anybody doing AdWords in here, by the way? Anybody? OK. I, I feel like I'm talking to a whole room. People are like, I don't know what he's saying. <laughs> All right, I'll skip that. Cool. So let me move into what content kind of is and what it isn't. So the idea is that you need to include everything. And I continue to have these battles with uh, my founders and previous founders. You know, the question of would we consider it to be a good idea to put a meme in an article about identifying innovation best practices within large corporations? The, the target audience of that post, I mean, that's, that's supposed to be for CTOs, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. And I included Elon Musk smoking a joint. And they're like, is this relevant for our audience? And I said, fuck, yeah, it is. Of course it is, right? I want to entertain people. I want to delight the people that are reading this. I want them to chuckle as they're going through it. I don't need to be stuffy and boring. And honestly, insurance, not the sexiest thing in the world. You have to find a way to make it interesting. So that's memes, that's infographics, that's things that kind of drive the point home metaphorically, whether it's pictures or something that's funny that isn't a direct relational type of thing. Embedding videos, the only things that are uh, pitfalls within this, I assume your blog's hosted on WordPress, right? Or, no, you don't have a blog. That's a whole different battle. Uh, getting there. Um, well, for the benefits of either your site or WordPress, don't embed anything off of Giphy. Uh, it basically adds a, a, an extra like 20 lines of CSS, uh, and it slows your, your entire site down. So. Always, if you're using WordPress for a blog in the future, make sure to upload everything to the media folder. Just a, a little thing in there. Um, yeah, click to tweets, not as valuable. Nobody in Denmark uses Twitter, so I don't know if that's super relevant for you guys. Um, <laughs> last little thing. <laughs> well, it's true. 
Last little thing I, I wanted to touch on within some of the content stuff was Jonah Berger's steps to virality. I think you should think of your content the same way that you think of your social media stuff. And the goal is to produce something in the way of a reaction. And these are kind of the reactions that take place. Uh, this is social currency triggers, emotion, public. Uh, I'll go over these. So social currency is basically something that the reason that we share stuff in general is because we either want to look smart or sound cool. That's it. And the concept is if you put something out that you're like, I believe this because I'm awesome, uh, people tend to engage with that. And it's one of those things that that's why it gets shared. So if you find something that's kind of a Billy Badass type post, maybe it makes people seem cool to share. That's why technology news tends to get a lot of engagement. Anytime you add the phrase Elon Musk to any blog post, people are like, oh shit, it, it works. So, and I've seen this within construction project management software over at Genie Belt, and I've certainly seen this on any type of tech uh, blog or anything like that. Triggers is kind of the top of mind stuff. Um, an example of that was like a, a post from Finding Neverland. You guys ever seen that movie? It's kind of an old one. Uh, it has Johnny Depp with a little kid on a bench, and uh, the Johnny Depp says, why are you so sad? And he says, well, it's summer, and the, the Johnny Depp goes, well, that's not sad. Why are you sad about that? And he goes, well, I live in Denmark. And then it's, ah, uh, you know, it's one of those things that we all can relate to. Um, so emotion, emotion is one of those things that's the strongest one. That's why you see bullshit Super Bowl ads that are basically all about the warm and fuzzies, and like, this car has love, you know? And like it, there's an ad about a referee that made a bad call and then it's raining and he's walking down a dirt road and the kid's like, dad, we should pick him up. And it's like, you drive a Subaru because you love people. I, I don't get those ads, but it's a thing. And it has a really big pull. It's the strongest of, of all of these. Uh, in terms of public, um, it's basically kind of mixed between triggers as well, but the concept is basically something that we all know and appreciate. Uh, practical value is my favorite, and that's what I focus the most on. Stuff that people can use, stuff that somebody would bookmark, stuff that mom would send over to you to say, hey, you should look at this, that kind of thing. Uh, and then stories. Stories is, uh, it's how we're wired. You know, we're narrative-based beings. The idea of the reason that we learn to run away from the lion is somebody on the savannah got eaten by a lion and somebody told the story. So the idea is that we need narratives in order to remember things. So narratives in terms of case studies, how so-and-so, the 25-year-old, saved for the next big vacation using your app, maybe that's something that you should focus on. Uh, and the last little thing that I'll go into, so nobody is going to get a business-to-business -business logo tattooed on their, their, their shoulders or wherever these are. There's a lot of fat people that get this done. Um, <laughs> But the idea is that you know, you're, you're a business to consumer brand. People can get excited about your stuff. Uh, you should be focused on stuff that people will get excited about and that lifestyle element. Producing things that are lifestyle based that might have more of a narrative focus or emotion could be a big selling point for you, who knows. Uh, this is something that I consistently battle with. It's not me on the ground, uh, but it, it's essentially finishing strong. The idea is that there is so much that goes into developing a 2,000, 3,000, 10,000 word blog post. And the idea is when you hit probably 8,000 words, you're like, fuck this noise, I'm done, I'm over it. I don't wanna write this concept anymore. I've beaten this uh, enough times, I don't wanna look at it. And that's where you lose. It's the, that last five, 10% that really drives this thing home. And I can't tell you how many times I have to sit with my content writers and basically say, look, you, you started amazing. And I can tell there's been a, a channel shift in terms of the way that you've been producing this. Please finish strong, right? Because the difference between a really great blog post and something that's meh is about 10%. And that's it. It's really simple. So uh, some quick wins for you guys. Uh, did a little digging and I wanted to show off a couple of things, but um, I went over a bunch of stuff there and there's a lot more to come, but does any of does this resonate with people? Does this make sense to you guys? Okay. Is there anything that I didn't touch or wasn't clear on in some of the other stuff so I can jump into some of the quick wins? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I weave 
that in with some of the CRO stuff. So that should be helpful. Um, so quick wins. Uh, your href lang tags are all fucked up. Um, so let me show a quick example real quick. Wait, hold on. Is this full screen still? No, good. All right, so let me jump over to talent lift and then back to you guys. So talent lift, talent lift was a company that L-Y-F-T that we listed on, I think it was like one of the top SaaS things relatively recently. Um, one minor thing that you'll see at the very top is this little uh, subdomain, uh, sorry, subdirectory, and that is the difference between being able to tell Google this is for either targeted within English speaking browsers or English speaking companies so that they know to funnel traffic one direction versus another. Uh, the one thing that you guys are missing on yours is even though I'm on the English side, you have, oh, there we go. I'm on the Danish side, you have the Danish tag, but when I jump over to the English side, uh, it's gone. And it's a really small thing, but within Search Console, in terms of structuring this and building out the site, uh, site maps to make sure that you're being crawled correctly for all of the English sites or potentially all of the English browsers, this has to be done. And it's a really simple thing, and this everybody gets this wrong. Uh, it, got, it was super wrong over at Plan Day, Genie Belt, uh, certainly hasn't changed over at Valuer. So everybody fucks this up, not a big deal. Uh, I included a bunch of links, I'm jumping around too much, a bunch of links in here of kind of the explanation. Neil Patel is like a really nice outline of kind of the differences between the two. I, I mean, you've already started the subdirectory route as opposed to the CC TLDs. So it's your call, but it's a really simple kind of site schema and site map thing that has to be done in order to parse everything out. Um, so this isn't for everybody, just a quick win on that. Um, I did want to show some of your top pages and what you're ranking for. So, lunarway.com. So you're not going to see this inside of top content because you don't have a blog, which uh, you should really have, like, oh, okay. Interesting. I didn't find it, but uh, no harm, no foul. But I wanted to show you guys this. Uh, oh. Sorry, again, the keywords. So, am I on the right one? Yeah, okay. So if we look down, this is kind of like a weird structure, but if we look down basically the sites that are doing <clears throat> the, the sites, the pages that are doing the best in terms of overall traffic volume, it's consistently your site calculator. And what that means is that you've found something that works. You found a little sliver of gold in this this there hills. So the idea is I would consider doing another iteration of this. So a calculator that calculates how much do I have to save in order to go on vacation? How much do I have to save in order to put down a down payment? How much do I have to save in order to do X, Y, or Z? But what you end up having here in terms of aggregating the most amount of traffic is consistently basically pages that are redirecting to uh, yeah, your calculator, which is kind of nice. Um, but I wouldn't put all my money on these staying that way forever. Um, so I don't know, it's just something that I found interesting and, and maybe there's something that you can benefit from, from seeing that. It's not top content, there we go, top pages. Let me put in Lunar Week. Good, and it's working. It's working really well for you guys. Uh, and I would definitely consider doing another iteration of a calculator. Um, again, under top pages, I would say that you could, United States, you do all countries. That's what was thrown off. Cool. So yeah, URL structure, baller, you got that right. Um, and yeah, most of the stuff that's really pulling traffic is that calculator. So make another calculator. If this seems to be drawing enough people in, why not? Um, I would just focus on converting people that go to that and finding different ways to get them in or at least get them to give an email address at some point. Um, but it seems to be working, so I thought there was some benefits to that. Did I skip? Nope. Cool. Uh, so one of the things that I do think is relevant for a B2C type of solution for you guys is a resource section. 
the idea of the subcategory of blog or article or news. It's not generating as much value these days, and for the life of me, I can't understand why. It's a direct result of this core update that I, I was explaining earlier. So the idea of evergreen content that sits in your resource section is where to go. So let me show talent lift again and why that's valuable. OIFT. So consistently, the pages that are ranking for these guys, they basically have defined a bunch of things within a resource section. So resources, 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 the occasional blog, resources, blog, blog, resources, resources. So let me show you what that looks like on here. Uh, and it's actually really good user experience as well. Um, they have a great backlink profile. So let's say I, I wanna go into templates. Again, these guys, different business model, they're job posting software, uh, but the, the, the job description templates, and the idea is they're basically ranking for job description template and these names. And what they sell is essentially the ability to post jobs. So they've figured out kind of a second iteration or different way of what people might be searching for in order to get something in the way of a resource in order to find out about you. You have to kind of play that game of what are the two steps before they think to search for something that I'm selling. And it's pretty amazing. They're not very robust, but these guys are aggregating a ton of traffic, have a ton of keywords based on really uh, pretty basic articles. Let me show you what they look like just on an overall scheme real quick. Uh, here. So overview, uh, the type of growth that they have is pretty baller and that's because they're providing a lot in the resource section. Um, that's really hard to do. These are referring domains and it's almost purely because they built out the resource section over the last six months and that's what I'm seeing. And in terms of all the organic keywords, 110K is pretty baller. Um, I can show you value where we're pretty far from that. And I'd like to think we put out a lot of content. 7.8, so uh, thousands less, um, but still a lot of referring domains. Um, so yeah, just something to think about. Can you check how many you have? Sure. Five point four. And that's okay. You guys got a little hit off of uh, this uh, algorithm update kind of set up here over the last little bit. Um, I would imagine it's probably the uh, the core update that probably hurt you because it's more for tech and finance. So that, that's what happened. And you'll see that on your, uh, your S or analytics as well. And how much longer am I basically out of time? Thirteen, twenty-one, one, twenty-one. Yeah, just five more minutes. Okay, sure. All right. Sure. Uh, last little bit uh, that I'll go into. A uh, couple of quick wins would be uh, optimizing your your pages for conversion rate optimization (CRO). So, hello bar or convertful or something that basically gives people another conversion outlet would be really easy for you guys. So, if you look up hello bar push notifications, either push crew or something similar. So when you see that pop up on the top left of the screen that says allow or block, that basically builds kind of a, a funnel of its own. Not a lot of uh, conversions off of that and people tend to unknowingly end up saying allow, but don't worry about it. You guys already have an exit pop up, I've seen it. Um, sleep now, yeah, yeah, okay. Good, and I mean, so long as you have one, it's another chance to kind of test it out and see what works. Um, I would definitely test out uh, different landing pages. 63% uh, more conversions with longer landing pages. That means way more content than people want to see. And the short ones don't actually work. I know you're loving it because I've had this conversation thousands of times with all kinds of other companies. They don't believe me until they actually test. And the way that you can test is using a ton of different tools. Optimizely is the most expensive, VWO. Google Optimize is relatively cheap and new, so you get basically 5,000 unique trials, which is one A-B test, but it's something you should definitely consider. I didn't see AMP pages on your site. You should definitely be doing that. Accelerated mobile pages, basically allowing people to look on a mobile phone, allowing for a faster user experience overall. Do you have those? No. AMP pages are, I mean, it, it's Google's framework, so shocker, Google wants everybody to use their framework. 
Um, but yeah, something to consider. Here's some of the conversion tools for AV testing. Um, one thing that I think would help for you guys uh, is Inspeclit. Inspeclit is GDPR compliant, so long as you put it in the privacy kind of stuff. I'll show real quick. I know I'm running out of time. Basically, it's screen recordings. Where's my non, they're all the same. Sorry, I have two different uh, Chrome tabs. The idea is one is for uh, SEO, so Inspeclit. So the idea is it's screen recordings. Again, GDPR compliant, you don't have to worry about it. But I get to see where people are fucking up and getting stuck on the site. So the concept is I can see everybody's actions on my different pages. So this is how somebody is going through and interacting with, which one is this? This is the about page. So this is a real person's recording. I get to see when they get stuck. I get to see when they actually go, oh, I'm gonna convert now. I get to see when they jump around. This pulls out so much information when a form might be broken or something isn't working the way that you thought it was. And it's also a great way to just kind of test out what you thought was gonna be the reality. Um, and I think that's about it. Uh, last little bit, sorry. Last little bit, uh, yeah, I know. Need something for the mouth of that. True. Uh, yeah, I didn't get to go into like referral campaigns and that kind of stuff. I don't know, Google that stuff. Um, <laughs> I'll do that, I don't know, I'll do that later. Um, just realize that it's six months to, to really build foundations on this stuff. It looks like you guys have a solid foundation, but it's six more months to get something in the way of this rapid scaling. Anybody that tells you they can do it in a month or even three months is full of shit or selling you something. So um, a lot of these take time, money, and energy, and I think you guys are doing fine, but I don't know, that, that's all the time I have. I wish I had more time, but that's it. So. Do you have something to refer from this slide? I do. Um, is it some of the yeah, I mean, I can send out, so these are just basically like the explanations of, of can I get like five minutes? Is that fine? Yeah, no, no, but it's up to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, real quick. Um, won't take long. So the way that... Uber, Airbnb, and I don't know, a number of these kind of smaller, even B2B solutions scaled relatively quickly was figuring out what their customer acquisition cost was and basically trying to sell something that benefited two parties as a direct result of it. So the idea is the customer acquisition cost for a new person that would join Uber was $25. So they realized that they would net $5 if they gave $10 to the person as a coupon to start using the platform, the app, Uber, and they also gave five, no, $10 to the person that referred them. So there's a ton of different tools that you can use to basically monitor this and reward this. So there's referral Sasquatch, get, uh, Sasquatch, get Ambassador, um, and probably about a half a dozen more if you Google them. But the idea is being able to make sure that you're monitoring based on unique coupon codes and also making sure that you're giving credit to those that are referring those that are in it. The concept is this has its own element of virality, but you need to also figure out your lifetime value. So if the customer acquisition cost is, I don't know, 20 bucks, $25, like I said before, but people only stick around for one payment or one iteration, you might not make your money back over the long run. But the idea is at least it's worth testing. And there are out-of-the-box solutions that do that. And I list a few different examples of how this is. Okay. Yeah. Fifty kroners too little, right? Yeah. So how much is something that makes sense to people? So if there's more incentive, and this is, I mean, this is like every business out there right now. The whole idea of like those scooters out there is that rate that they charge right now for the Lime scooters is not what they're planning on charging in two years. They're trying to get enough people on the platform or using those scooters in order to build up a big case to say, look, we need more money, invest, invest. But they're giving people incentives to basically do this. 
So the idea is instead of 50 kroner, see where that threshold is, mm -hmm. test it out. So see if people are actually engaging with and reaching out to the mountain saying, hey, you need to sign up with me and it's a big competition uh, because I want all my friends to use this because I get 200 kroner for every person that signs up with me. And the idea is that see how long people stay with you. You can still make that money back in year two, three, and four. This is why internet hosting sites make uh, the cost of hosting on either one.com or Bluehost, it's like five bucks a month. They don't tell you that second and third year jumps up to fucking $400, you know? It's crazy. But the idea is that this should work for you. I don't know what your churn rate is, and I don't know what the customer acquisition cost is or the lifetime value, but you should be able to work out what the value is in order to get a maximum threshold of people that are interested that get incentivized to basically say, I will give this to all of my friends and see what works. There are a number of mobile solutions as well that allow you to basically reach out to everybody within your contact list. That's interesting too. They don't actually have to do it through your app, which means you're GDPR compliant as well. Um, I can't remember the names of them off the top of my head, but if you basically look up uh, something in the way of SMS referrals uh, via phone contacts, you should be able to find a number of startups that basically do that. So the idea is you harvest every single user's contacts, so long as they obviously get permission and it's sent out through them, which is pretty cool. And the idea is you got to incentivize people. I mean, that's the reason anybody does anything. The reason I recycle is not because I feel like I want to do good by the environment. I mean, I guess that's nice, but it's because the recycling is just as easy as throwing something away in the trash. So the idea is make it easy or incentivize people to actually do something, you know, and I think 50 kroners is a little low. I don't yeah, know. It's just me. Maybe. Yeah. What is the platform that you run the referrals off of? Okay. Yeah, a lot of companies do, especially when it's a business to consumer type thing. Business to business, way harder. Um, but, you know, the inside of the slides, this is here for you. Um, you can look up 47 examples of referral programs. So if nothing else, get ideas from other people. Like nothing's original these days. Steal from other people. Yeah, it's all in there. Oh, that's right. Yeah, um, sure. And uh, okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, you know, I actually get paid to do this. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so I, I list a number of different tools for discovering influencers. Uh, I think the most important thing is to discover and, and get a feel for what works. It's a lot of guess and check, unfortunately, and you really need to figure out kind of your buyer personas. And that dictates whether or not the reach that you end up having is working. So, you know, somebody can have one of the great examples is like Tomsner, right? Do you guys know Tomsner? They're a, a Danish company that basically does like analytics for soccer, football. Uh, and the idea is that they were actually generating a shit ton of new uh, users based on going after large, well-known soccer players. And they only did influencer marketing, which works. Uh, the idea and, and what has worked for me in the past is basically making an extremely low offer and then countering their high offer with another lower offer. Uh, and then you actually get to a point where you can play ball. Um, but the idea of finding them either using uh, BuzzSumo, Discoverly, uh, BuzzStream is all right. Uh, it really depends on your target market because you guys are only focused on Denmark right now, right? And Sweden. Okay. I haven't played enough inside of just kind of the Nordics to give you enough insights, but there's certainly enough tools to be able to start breaking apart these and then figure out, you know, as Tomsner did, when you get five or six of these people that agree under a certain stipulation, whether it's a thousand kroner, or two thousand kroner, or ten thousand, that should set a price point so that you can make a case for getting a better deal and a better deal and a better deal. Well, we got these guys for eight hundred, and they're like, "Well, I charge a thousand. It's like, well, I mean. I'm getting 800 over here. Can you meet me halfway? Even though maybe <laughs> maybe you never even did a deal with them. I have no idea. Uh, 
No, they're full of shit. I think that's the problem is nobody has really good metrics on what uh, this is actually driving. And I think you'd be surprised as to how low a lot of these people should go. And realistically, it's also a, a relatively unknown in terms of generating metrics on this to be able to say, because this person has X amount of followers, they are going to be uh, a far better influencer and get us more leads. A leader views followers, engagement, views engagement. It's smart. Yeah. You need to figure out. And what about the price of this correct to release the same as me? And a lot of money, a lot of time, and information. And when you put them through the most of the big ones, the agencies, and it's fixed price. Yeah, don't do that. You can't go It's called DMing. Yeah, you can. So the idea is that you need to follow and DM all the people that are more interesting to you. Agencies get a cut, right? And not everybody has an agent. You should be going after small to medium sized influencers, not the millions of influencer people. And by the way, most of those are fake anyways. I can show you off of, I'll show you a couple of different ways that you can get fake, uh, fake engagement. So Black Hat World or Warrior Form, you can buy engagement. I mean, shit, I can get you a million followers tomorrow. I got the time. Uh, I, I mean, it's really easy to do that. And that's why people are doing this as well is they want to get people under the impression they do have 1.2 million followers. But the reality is, I mean, it, it, it's all vanity metrics. I think you need to figure out who's actually really active with their audience. Engagement is important, but also go after the small to medium sized players, not the largest ones. You'll, you'll end up depleting your budget before you get anything off the ground. And do DMs, direct outreach, always, direct messaging. Cool. That was really nice. Sure, thanks guys. Hope that was helpful. Um, Cool. I, I mean, again, we we do a class for this kind of thing, and um, yeah, I, I mean, it's it's a good class. Um, imagine this, but for sixteen to eighteen hours. So, <laughs> so yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys. Cool.